So today we're going to step back one chapter to chapter 13. I wanted to do WAN and frame relay first because it's got more to think about, more to absorb than this does. IPv6 is a reality. IPv6 is kind of not a reality for us yet because the U.S. invented the Internet, so the U.S. owns all the IPv4 uh, addresses. And we really hadn't had to go to IPv6. Europe, Asia have done that. There's just going to be a slide in here that said when they originally gave IPv4 addresses to Asia and Africa, they gave them one class C subnet. Okay? What has kept us in the IPv4 business for such a long time is NAT and proxy servers, but NAT primarily because you can run your whole business as long as you don't, what is it, 5,000, I think is what we said. Don't have that many. That's, that would be, I think, a little excessive, but, you know, several hundred clients you can run on the single IP address. So that's kept us in the game. Eventually, we're going to have to go to IPv6. IPv6 is more efficient. IPv6 is more secure. It does some really kind of clever things. And we'll have slides on these. I'll, we'll, I'll ramble here for a few minutes, and then we'll go through the slides. But it checks the path before it actually starts sending data to find out what the maximum transmission unit is, the smallest MTU in the path, and then sets the MTU at that, at that size. It has IPsec built in. I know we, we briefly said VPN, VPN IPsec. We encrypt the data. What we do is encrypt the data, put a new header on it, send it so it can go across the routers. Because if you send an encrypted IP address to a router, it's just going to throw it away. It can't read it. Now, it is better. And it has a lot more addresses. We're going to have a number here in a minute. I think it's like 3.4 times 10 to the 38th or 4.3 times 10 to the 34th. 2 to the 128th, really big number of addresses. I think that that I heard read somewhere it's something like I don't know about a million addresses for every square inch of Earth. That probably is a little excessive, but are we going to run out? Hopefully not, but could we run out? Certainly. And when they came up with IPv4, I'm sure they weren't saying, "Hey, in 30 years or 20 years, we're going to run out of addresses, so they'll figure something out. They didn't think they were going to run out of addresses either. As we continue to put IP addresses on devices, we're going to need more of them, obviously. Most of you guys have smartphones. You need an IP address for that, don't you, in order to be able to get your information. One of the things that you talk about is... Uh, is refrigerators and stoves and washing machines that have IP addresses that they can do truck cars that they can actually do troubleshooting do analysis of the product before they go to try to repair it so you can take the parts uh, cars so that they can can communicate with them and mostly for uh, analysis troubleshooting those kinds of things are what they're used for. But more and more and more devices have IP addresses. The one that's always my favorite is, and some other countries, like Australia, are much further ahead of us in certain things. What if you wanted to use your uh, ATM card to buy a soda? Could you do that? Yep. In some places. Mm -hmm. What's that going to require? A, a wireless connection. And what's the wireless connection going to require? IP address. When you do that, you can become more efficient in your inventory also. You can have those machines report when they need to be uh, renewed, replenished, and what to bring to the machine. So all of this expansion helps in some ways, but in the addressing space, something still has to be done in order to, to make them work. Now, if I can get the thing to, to go forward here. Okay, so chapter 13 objectives include what is IPv6 and IPv6 is a new addressing scheme. Some changes, some things are familiar, some things change a lot. And you don't have to write 
all those 255s with it. it it's written in a is written in hexadecimal. Each of the hexadecimal groupings has 16 bits in it, and we use the forward slash bits in order to represent the network portion of the address. We still have subnets. You can still subnet these things. There are a number of different parts of the addressing format that are used. We do away with some things like there's no broadcast address anymore. Hallelujah, no more broadcast. But there is this other cool thing called an anycast, which allows you, and I'll have a slide on that, I hope, which allows you to assign the same IP address to more than one device, and it finds the closest one. They kind of do that now. When you go to Google, do you think everybody goes to the same Google place? They go through a lot of processing in order to send you to the closest server. Email kind of the same way as we do those things. So what is IPv6? Why do we need it? IPv6 addressing, address types, special addresses, auto configuration, configure an IPv6, and I want to do a little demo on IPv6. And the routing protocols are basically there. We have to enable IPv6 because it's not enabled by default on the Cisco routers. In the early days, IPv4 wasn't enabled, so you had to give the really old routers a command called IP routing. In this one, it's IPv6 unicast or unicast routing. So you have to turn it on before it is usable. And I want to go through a demo. Turn it on and doing RIP because it's the easiest one, quickest one to do. RIP is called RIP Next Generation, which is essentially RIP v2. OSPF and EIGRP have IPv6 uh, versions. I'm trying to think of the word here. IPv6 versions. So special addresses, auto configuration, and configure it. Tunneling. Tunneling is available if we have, maybe we have an IPv4 and our ISP is IPv6. What you do is put an IPv6 header on your IPv4 traffic to go across the six network. Other way around, if we were running six and the uh, ISP was running four, we would put a four header on the six packet to send it across the four network, the version four network, so those things. Rationale, and obviously this came from a different presentation, there is an IP address shortage, and we are in pretty good shape. This is the one Asia and Africa received a single class C for the entire, this says country, continent, uh, that was a few years ago. They've since they have more. They they those countries have done a better job of going to IPv6 because of they had to. It's out of necessity. We haven't had to, so we haven't really made a lot of progress in the U.S. There's still some discussion as to what they're going to do with it. Uh, some of the security issues. There is no NAT. I'll say there is no NAT, and then I'm going to tell you that there is a NAT a little bit later on. But the NAT's just to NAT to an ISP, not to NAT to individual machines. A lot of people don't want their internal addressing scheme available. So if we use public addresses for everything, if you sit and watch long enough, you can get all the IP addresses of the internal networks. Not necessarily a good thing. So there are still some discussions about some things that go on. There is no NAT. Don't need NAT. We've got, we've got billions and billions and billions. This is not the one that's got the addresses, I will have, I'll, I'll show you the number in a minute. It's a huge number. Current IP addressing poorly allocated. Agencies needing a Class C asked for Class Bs and got it. The universities that were up front in the Internet, the ARPANET, got lots of addresses. There are a number of address ranges that aren't in use that universities or businesses own. As far as I can tell, based on an article, and this was earlier this year, I think in February or March, the last of the IPv4 address blocks have been allocated. So there are no more new addresses to be bought. If you if we watch the news a little bit, Microsoft was buying a company, and I don't know which one. It was a bankrupt company. What they were buying them for was the IP addresses so that they could can have them continue to expand. There are a number of universities that have accesses, and the where this presentation came from 
He said that he was at a course and somebody from the University of Utah said, hey, we've got a whole Class B subnet that we're not using. So there are others out there. If you look at who gets who gets the Class A addresses when you do things and if you do pings and trace, trace routes and things like that, which companies have those? Those are the ones that were in the front end of the Internet. Who has the tens or the tens and nines, the sixes and the the under 127 addresses. New network devices on the rise, that's what we were talking about early on. The, the uh, washing machine that you want to have troubleshot before the guy gets there so that it can report. The car, and they got a couple of commercials, tell me about my car, how's it doing? Running checks on cars, sending the maintenance back to central location so that you can maintain records of those things. NAT, current situation, hindrance to innovation probably because if we didn't have NAT we would probably already be on IPv6 because there aren't enough of those addresses to take care of all of the devices that are required. IPsec everywhere and it, and it is more secure mobility, simpler header in the mobility is, is the anycast that you can have the same IP address on multiple devices and the system through its processing will find the closest of them. So we're going to have IPsec everywhere, the mobility, and it does have a simpler header. It's got a longer header, but it's got a simpler header. If you remember when we looked at the IPv4 header, it had all of those different fields in there. This one really doesn't have all of that. Much bigger because it's a 128-bit address. So when we go through those things. IPv6, the next generation internet protocol, originally created as the answer to the looming address exhaustion. Heard a thing or two about it. Flexibility, efficiency, capability, ever increasing needs. And it is the thing that's, at least in my generation and probably your lifetime, should take care of our address needs. But we never really know where we're going with these things because when I was your age, there wasn't such a thing as the Internet. When I went to college in my senior year, you know, we got all these computers and things like that. We did batch processing on a, on a mainframe. We weren't allowed to use, couldn't afford to have calculators until like my senior year. And the calculators that you got then, the one would do square roots, you know, multiplied multiply, divide, and add, square, square roots, cost, I don't know, $150, $200. $150, in the mid-70s, and you can translate that out with, with inflation, what that would be today. Why do we need it? And I think we've already talked about that, conserve bandwidth, the number of devices that we have. It is a more efficient protocol, the number of devices, just to get addresses on those devices. We're going to need to do those things. The address, this is what it looks like. And it says global prefix, and we'll talk about some prefixes. We're going to have three different types of addresses. We're going to have local addresses and global addresses. Global addresses we're going to go on the Internet with. Local addresses are going to be the ones within our network. They used to have, and they still have, they call them site, and they've changed the name of them, the local ones. And if you'll even look on your Windows machines here when we get through looking, and, and Microsoft constructs the IPv6 address a little bit differently than Cisco does. So the, the things that I'm talking about when we get over here to the last half were the self-assigned, the auto-configured uh, IP addresses, the ones that you see on the Microsoft machine are going to be constructed differently than the ones that you see on a Cisco router. So the Cisco router is going to use the MAC address, and Microsoft really doesn't do that. So the global beef prefix, the subnet, and then over here we have the interface ID. Cisco likes to use in this interface ID the MAC address. Kind of makes sense, except the MAC address isn't quite long enough because it's a 48-bit address, right? And this one is what? One, two, three, four times 16, 64-bit address. So what they do is put in the middle an FFFE, right in the middle of the address, and they split the MAC address. So when you see that, that's an auto-assigned Cisco address. 
the 2001 is the global prefix. 1FE tells you that it's a local address. So we can we can kind of do those things. And again, we do have subnets. The interface address 64 bits. The network addressing is 64 bits. How long is it going to be? Forward slice 64 says that the network 64 bits long. Forward slice 32 would be 32 bits long, just like you've seen before in the IPv4, except we have bigger numbers. It's kind of nice not to have to write 255, 255. It wouldn't be 255. It'd be FFFF, FFFF. I mean, it's kind of don't don't we don't have to do that. So address size from 32 to 128 bit, and here's the number. This number here is the number of addresses that are available, which would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. 3.4 times 10 to the 38th. You tell me how to say that number. I don't know. I don't even know what that is. A lot. A whole lot. Huh? And I, I know, but that's how many addresses are available. They have now issued less than 10% of the available addresses. Issued, not in use, but issued less than 10% of the available addresses. So to make it more manageable, it's divided into eight groups. This one, two, three, two, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, five, zero, 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 on and on and on and on and on. The things that generally I've seen by taking the Cisco and the Network Plus and the A Plus, what they usually want you to know about in IPv6 at this point is to recognize a couple of the rules and what's a valid address and what's a not valid address. One of the rules is eliminate groups of consecutive zeros. Instead of writing all of these zeros here, we can represent that with a double colon, colon, colon. You can only do that once. If we have one set of consecutive zeros and another set of consecutive zeros, you can only use the colon colon once because it wouldn't know how many groups of zeros were in each one. It knows how long the address is supposed to be. And if you do a colon colon here, it can calculate how many zeros. You also don't have to write leading zeros. So you can shorten these things up. The 0 AB4 here just becomes AB4. So you can shorten them up. And if we had a colon colon, we had some more zeros, we could represent that with just a 0. So those things, the two rules, rule 1, eliminate groups of consecutive zeros and drop the leading zeros. And I think in the homework questions, you can see a number of them. How do you rewrite this? Is this a valid address? Those kinds of things. And that's what I typically see on the... Uh, in the testing because we we really haven't gotten very far in the implementation of this addressing scheme yet. They had earlier this year test your IPv6 kind of thing <clears throat> where they checked to see who was available. I went and did it said so my computer was good, my ISP was good, but my router, my router's not because it's no router. Uh, the new routers, I don't know, you know, as they go, they're going to be upgraded. The Cisco devices you're going to find our IPv6 capable. It's not turned on by default. So we'll have to turn it on in order to make it work. Windows, Windows XP, you can add IPv6 support to it. You have to go in and do it. Vista and Windows 7, it's there by default automatically. And it will get the addresses that it needs. It'll get, it'll get the, the tunneling addresses, all sorts of of things that are required for it. This is basically the same thing that we just said, colon zero, zero. This this would be a string of zeros. We could actually represent this, and if we go down here after the 12 with the colon, colon. And again, just with the zero, if we drop the leading zeros, it would be a zero. You can And, an, and you can only have the colon, colon once, and you're going to see that in questions. I have the colon, colon twice. That's an invalid address because it doesn't know how many bits to have. Talked about the header. Just as an example here, we have a version header link type of service, total length, identification flag, fragment offset, time to live, protocol, header checksum, and then the addresses in the IPv4 header. In the IPv6 header, version, traffic class, flow label, payload length, next header, hop limit, and then the address. So it is a simpler, but when we get to the addressing, we have to have 128 bits for 
for both the source and the destination address. So it's bigger, a bigger header, but it's a simpler header, which makes it easier for the routers because they don't have to look for so much stuff in the header. Stuff, good technical term. They don't have to look to see what's marked in the header. There aren't as many fields to look at, which is going to make the processing in the routers quicker. The address types, and we're going to go flip back and forth between this presentation and the other one, obviously. Unicast, global unicast, link local, unique local, multicast, and anycast. The unique local is the one I used to call site, which allows you as a business to get an identifier, which is kind of like getting a subnet, a network address. Unicast, unicast is one-to-one. -one. Link local is kind of like the private IP addresses. And then multicast obviously goes to a group of computers or devices. And when we talk about multicast, if you'll go back to the routing protocols, a number of those are multicast. RIP NG, RIP Next Generation is going to be a multicast protocol. EIGRP was a multicast protocol. It's a multicast protocol. OSPF was a multicast protocol. It's a multicast protocol. Those devices listen on specific addresses for information. So the multicast is still there. But again, the thing that you don't see is the broadcast. There are no broadcasts at this, at, at, at this day, the no broadcast packets for IPv6. Back to the other one, unicast one-to-one, -one, multicast one-to-many, anycast one to closest. That's kind of a convenient thing. If you're a large corporation, let's say eBay, and you have servers in the US and in Europe and in Australia and maybe in the Soviet Union, instead of all of those users going to a single server, they'll go to the closest server. Again, they do that now. There's a lot more processing that's required, DNS processing that's required in IPv4. It, it is done now, but it's not done as simply as it, as it is here. So in the link local address, the link local address is the layer two domain. The link local address would be in this room because we're on a separate subnet. Would be a layer two because that stuff goes as far as the router, obviously. A unique site local scope address is an organization. The global scope address is the Internet. So we, if we look at this uh, visual down here at the bottom, we have the global scope, which is the Internet. And within that, we have a unique, or unique site, site scope. They used to call it site scope. Now they call it unique scope. And as they, as they continue, we continue to progress towards this thing, the names change a little bit. But this would be one that would be assigned to your organization. And then within that, the link local scope. Link local scope are the ones inside a layer two area. The unique or site, site kind of makes that site would be like here in Roanoke. Link local assigned automatically as an IPv6 host comes online. Similar to the 169.254, can't find a can't find a uh, DHCP server address. Always begins with FE0, and the first 10 bits are 1111110110, followed by 54 bits of zeros. And if you work that out in hex, it's going to be the FE80. The last 64 bits is the 48-bit MAC address, and again, this is Cisco. And if you look at the FE address on your Windows 7 machine, you say, I don't see the MAC address in there. I think you're going to say, I don't see the MAC address in there. So what we do for the link local, the local addresses, the self-assigned, the 169 formerly addresses, FE0, and then the MAC address with an FF, FE spliced in the middle. You're looking at me funny, Stephen. The MAC address 0019D1, and then FFFE, and then the rest of it, 22DCF3. That's the way the architects decided to do it. That's the way the system reads. Instead of putting it at the front end or the back end, they put it in the middle. Don't know why. Not 
not in, not in the in group with those. Unique local or site local, again, unique local used to be site local, is address argued used within the enterprise network to identify the boundary of their networks, the boundary of the ECPI, what well, we use the 10 networks now. Following format, FC00 colon colon forward slash 7 is 7 bits. So this thing has an FC00 zero, zero, and then 1 is locally assigned and then 0 is for future use. So what you wind up with is a 1 in this bit in order to do that. 40 bits for the global ID, 16 net bits for the subnet ID, and then the interface ID, 64 bits again whatever you're going to use. And again, Cisco uses the MAC addresses, and that's the that's the, the EUI 64, I think, is what, what he calls it in this book. <clears throat> Global addresses have their high three bits set to 0, zero 1. The high three bits, the one on the far left. 0, zero 1, and the subnet ID and the interface ID. Global routing prefixes, 48 bits or less, 48 bits or less, 64 minus N, bits here would give us those. The subnet ID is whatever bits are left over after the global routing prefix. Primary address is expected to be to compromise our 2001 and the 2001 global internet is what we're, th those routable addresses should be, the two 2001 addresses. These machines that have IPv6 actually find all their neighbors. They, it becomes more efficient. It does a lot of work for you. When you're looking for a router, it does, it does a, uh, a request, asks the router where it is, what its address is, and then the router responds. So it, it IPv6 does do some of the, I won't say heavy lifting, but some of the lifting, some of the configuration work for us. And, as we get more into it, trying to implement it, we're going to learn a whole lot more about it, obviously. But right now, what do you need to know about it? Basically, the uh, what's there, what the uh, basically what's what it looks like right now, and kind of some of the special characters. Zero dot zero dot zero. What was zero dot zero dot zero? That was like any address, any network, right? It's represented by a colon colon. Equals the 127.0.0.1 is represented by colon colon 1. It's all zeros and the 1 at the end. IPv4 address will be written in the IPv6, IPv4, 00019216800. We append the IPv4 or put the IPv4 address as the last 32 bits of the IPv6. 2004 slash 3, the global unicast address. The first three for the uh, and FC00, 2000, global, FC00, local cast, FE80, the link local unicast addresses. And if you look, you're going to see at least some of those on your, on your Windows 7 machines as they come up. The unicast range, and these are all in the book. There's no need in reading these. 2002 forward slash 16, used for, that's me go back to that, used for the 6 to 4 tunnel, actually we'll get to that. Because we'll, 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 how are we going to get from where we are to where we want to be? Migration, one of them dual stack routers where we run IPv4 and IPv6 on the same routers. And if it's an IPv6 packet, it takes it, if IPv4, it takes it. Tunneling 6 to 4 and 4 to 6. What you do there, same as with a VPN, is you take the whichever it is and put the other header on it to send it across that network. And there'll be a picture here in a minute. But if we had a two, four IPv4 networks in this building and we wanted to go across a, an IPv6 ISP, when it got to the IPv6 router, it would attach an IPv4 header, an IPv4 IP address, and send it to the other end. That's when we're talking about header. We're talking about routable headers in order to get it there. NAT protocol translation, and I said there is no NAT, there is four transition, not the NAT individual IP addresses, but to NAT them from one protocol type to the other protocol type. The NAT, and this is an example, we had an IPv4 client, what this example is supposed to show here is 
duels the same thing. The IPv4 client gets out here on the IPv4 internet and is trying to go to a location that's only available in the IPv6 internet. It gets netted out here in the IPv4 internet to IPv6 to get the information that gets netted back and sent back on the IPv4 network. If you're going to the IPv6, the IPv6 client, if it was trying to go to somewhere it was only on the IPv4 internet, same thing would happen. It would get netted to an IPv6 address. The 6 to 4, <clears throat> what we have here is an IPv4 network with IPv6 addresses in the back end. What happens, the dual, uh, excuse me, the dual stack, whichever one we're going to use, if we use the uh, 6 to 4 tunneling here, when it got up to the IPv4, if we had a 6 address, we'd put an IPv4 address on it, an IPv4 header. To send it across the IPv4 network, when it gets to the other end, we take the header off and then we do the IPv6 routing on the back side. Tunnels typically are going to be point to point. You can do other types of tunnels, but this is this would be, let's say that here in Roanoke we're running IPv6 and there in Virginia Beach they're running IPv6 and we both want to be able to use that, but the ISP between us and them was running IPv4. When we got to the, to the endpoint of the IPv4 network, we put an IPv4 address on it and they would send it to that location. When it got there, it would strip off the version 4 header and do the routing using version 6. That's all, that's all any tunnel does. An IPsec tunnel is the same thing. We had encrypted at one end, stick an IP address on it, send it to the other end, strips the IP address off, decrypts it. That's the way tunnels work. You just, you just put a different header on them so that they can get across the cloud, the magic cloud, the Internet itself. Auto configuration, we've talked a little about a host sends a, an RS message to the router. The router, send, the router sends a message back. Host receives a, a, a reply from the router prefix allowing it to auto configure its interface. The prefix, what network am I on, basically, uh, as we go through those things. Configuring IPv6, and I want to go through one with this. The first thing we have to do in config is IPv6 unicast routing. We have to tell it to use IPv6 because, again, by default, it's not there. If you go back in history, some of the really old Cisco routers didn't have IPv4 configured to start automatically. You had to give it an IP routing. You had to configure type IP routing. Now it's part of the startup configuration that comes with it. IPv6 prefix, the EUI64 will get the addressing that it needs. And you see we have here we have the FFFEF3, and the rest of this would be the MAC address with that spliced in the middle. You can specify the entire range if you want to, and, and again, I want to go through a, a brief example of that. But right now, let's take a break, and then when we come back, we'll do the example, and then we'll do some labs. <laughs>